All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this NL seminar. Uh, we are very delighted today to have Bodhisattva Prasad Majumta uh, with us in, uh, to have an in person uh, NL seminar. So, Budi is a final year PhD student at CSC UC San Diego, advised by Professor Julian. Macaulay, his research goal is to build interactive machines capable of producing knowledge grounded explanations. He previously spent time at the Allen Institute of AI, Google AI, Microsoft Research, and FAIR or Beta AI, along with collaborations from the University of Oxford, University of British Columbia, and the Allen Institute, Alan Turing. Institute. His work has been recognized but by the UCSD CSE Doctoral Award for Research, Adobe Research Fellowship, Qualcomm Innovation Fellowship, and highlights of ACM Rexis, among many awards and several media coverages. In 2019, Budi led UCSD in the finals of the Amazon Alexa Prize. He also co-authored a, a best-selling NLP book with Already Media that is being adopted in universities internationally. Today, he will give a presentation on effective, explainable, and equitable NLP with word, no word knowledge and interactions. As a reminder, there will be a QA session at the end of the talk if we still have room, we still have room for that, but feel free to ask any questions at any time you might have throughout the talk. And as usual, please continue to meet your mics unless if we have you have a question or comment to ensure the clarity of the talk. Without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Budi, and I I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, Maria, and thank you everyone for hosting me today. Uh, today. Uh, I'm Bodhi, and today we're going to talk about effective, explainable, and equitable NLP with world knowledge and interactions. So, a bit about me. Uh, so, I'm from this uh, state called West Bengal, uh, eastern part of the India, and we're kind of known for our art and literature. Uh, you might have heard about Rabindranath Tagore, who was one of the first non European uh, to get the Nobel Prize in Literature. So, now, if that interests you a little bit about Bengali literature, and you want to know more about it, you can just Google it, or you can actually ask GPT-3 that, hey, can you recommend me some good Bengali books? And it currently uh, rightly says some of the plausible authors and also notes that Rubinath Tagore, and he has so many novels. So that's a perfectly valid recommendation to start with. Now, if I want to go a little bit in specific, for example, if I want to ask that, well, can you recommend me some Bengali books that, that released recently? Uh, it does come up with some names, but unfortunately, uh, it really confuses with the authors and the book's names. For example, it talks about The Girl with the Silver Eyes, which is not really authored by Santhani, for example, and there's no real author actually named Santhani. Uh, Sunil is a very popular author in Bengali, but the Black Prince is, is not really connected with that author. And these are the kinds of information that are, that are so readily available at, in the internet, Wikipedia. It's quite surprising that even this biggest model cannot really come up with these this specific names. So, those books from 2022? No, they're not. I mean, they don't exist. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so everything is wrong about, about this list of recommendations. Uh, okay, so let's say they gave the correct books, for example, and you really wanted to ask that, oh, why these two books? Like, why should, why should I cover these two books? Like, are, the, are they really good about the Bengali literature, for example, but they're like very popular? So, the product can come up with some kind of explanation. Uh, but it's really uh, weird. It says that these books are recent releases, so they're likely to be popular. That that, that doesn't really go along. I mean, why they're likely to be popular, for example. So there's problem there as well. Right. Now, if I kind of change my, uh, my query in a way saying that, well, I recently learned reading Bengali, and I'm not very proficient yet. So can you, can you recommend me some beginner level books? And I would expect it would say Rabindranath Tagore, as it did earlier it still comes up with the exact same list of the books. So that's absolutely surprising. And I did it in a more conversational fashion, so the history kind of remained. 
And uh, that can tell us that the model is really confused about this conversational history. Uh, in fact, it kind of uh, validated these three key properties that we want from an SSTVI that, that is being relevant, being trustworthy, and, and being, being adaptive. So let's look at this in a little bit in detail and what do we want this system to be, to be, to, to be relevant, trustworthy, and adaptive. So first, we want to make sure that the AI systems we are using for various assistance purposes, we want to make sure that they have this up-to-date knowledge or have access to this up-to-date knowledge. They should have the understanding about the world in a, in a way so that they should understand this concept of books being released in 2022 or recent books, for example, and eventually make some kind of common sense inference about the query that we are asked. For being trustworthy, it should be able to reason its decision, but it should be factually grounded. For example, here, it could have just looked into, let's say, popular opinions, let's say some book reviews in, in Goodreads, for example, and could perfectly come up with some facts that supports the fact that, oh, you should really read this book because it was very popular, highly rated, but it couldn't. And also it, it may or may not consider the social factors around, around some of the queries, for example, probably not directly related to this query, but in some cases it could be important to explain in a way that it also shows how it understands the world, society, and biases. And finally, which is probably the most important, if we want to make sure that if we have this uh, anthropomorphic expect, expectation from this AI system that they should talk like human, they should help like human, the first thing, the most important thing they should be is adaptive. They should be able to understand your query or your changing query and kind of update their prediction accordingly, which they really couldn't do uh, in this case. And in fact, there is a, a plethora of, of uh, yeah, NLP task that at least I care about and many of us here care about that requires the, the underlying model to be either relevant, trustworthy, or adaptive. Some of the uh, tasks would be like goal-oriented dialogue, recognition systems, factual language generation, or for example, you know, debiasing, natural language explanation, and some of the very new topics of like conversational recommendation, critiquing, and continual learning. So now, now the point is that these, these very big models, the state-of-the-art AI systems, they, they really struggle to perform most of these tasks. The question is why? So if we look at behind the scenes, uh, we find there are three uh, major components uh, behind these AI systems. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there are limitations in all of these three pillars that's kind of affecting the, uh, the performance of these AI systems. So for example, the data that we are uh, dealing with or training these models, they are temporarily, they are inherently temporal. They change every year, every time as the new information gets added, they're biased and they're also limited by its origin. So for example, if you train your AI model uh, before COVID time, it probably wouldn't be able to tell you like post COVID travel regulations if you're using that as a recommendation system. Similarly, the underlying model can be opaque and it can, can contain like spurious correlation. Like for example, we have seen many, many evidences where these, these models uses like syntactic nuances, like number of punctuations to kind of predict an NLI task, completely disregarding the contextual logic, right? Uh, so if it, is, if it is a black box model, you really don't know what's going on inside the model. And finally, uh, the way we're evaluating these models, most of the models, are kind of in a more offline fashion, right? For example, if you look at like recommendation system, which are out there in the in the in the in the production, they are still evaluated with offline data. So so we don't have any clue at the evaluation stage that how it would perform with a new user. So that's also a, a big challenge with these systems. Now to now kind of to address this gap, uh, I, I want to propose this this concept of interactive explainability. And I'm going to introduce like three vehicles for each of these three pillars and see that how that can somehow or partly address these, these gaps. So I argue that uh, for data, it should come with the associated knowledge or the background knowledge about its data point, uh, irrespective of the, whatever the task it is. And we should be able to have access to this knowledge at the training time or at the test time. And we should be, uh, be able to kind of inject that knowledge at the training time or the test time. So we should have methods and this repository of knowledge available with us. Of course, the model should be explainable. I mean, it should be able to produce both predictions and explanations so that we have better scientific understanding of these underlying models. And finally, you have to make sure that the way you're evaluating is more kind of in a human in the loop setup or performing user studies. For example, when you're evaluating like a conversational system, uh, apart from just looking at mixed response, you know, accuracy, you should really try to do put it out there and see that you know, does it actually help the user to enable the, the conversational goals that they want to achieve 
uh, or, or the task that you're performing. Right, so I, I, I touched upon these problems uh, in my PhD, but for today's talk, I'm gonna pick like three representative work from each of the pillar and we'll go over them in these three chapters and then we'll summarize with some, some future directions. Okay, so I'll start with the chapter one knowledge where we are talking about the post hoc knowledge injection to make, more, to, to make models relevant. And I'll explain why do we want to do it in a post hoc fashion and what we mean by that. All right, so let's, let's start with an example again. So it's a knowledge seeking dialogue setup. So you have, you have looked in, like you have gone to an AI system and asked for some recommendation to do something fun around, around San Diego area. Now, if your underlying model is trained on 2019, it will say that, well, you can go to Balboa Park, which is a very popular destination in San Diego. Now, that's perfectly valid answer if you're asking that in 2019. But if you ask that question in 2020, it's invalid because the park is closed because of, due to COVID-19. And in 2021, it's again closed because of construction, right? So, mm -hmm. it, so ideally, it should now give me answer that, oh, you can go to La Jolla Shores or basically these passing beaches around, around San Diego area. Now, now, for us, it's pretty easy to do because what you do when you really look for this recommendation, you just go to Yelp and look for recommendations, right? So the, my point is that this information is actually available out there, for example. And even if you even if you train the model in 2019, you probably just can look through very recent opinions about, about this kind of recommendation in internet, right? I mean, so basically, my, my point is that this information is abundantly available in the internet. It's just that you didn't have access to the, that knowledge when you trained your model. Now the question is that you can always add that new knowledge or, or whatever relevant knowledge and fine tune your model. So the model knows about uh, the relevant scenario, the recent knowledge, and it can give you the correct answer. The problem is that if you keep on fine tuning and you don't know what is the frequency of that fine tuning would be, it's really resource inefficient, right? So a, a, a greener way of addressing this problem would be to, uh, without doing any additional training, if you can inject this knowledge somehow in the, the default response that model has produced, and somehow change it, somehow edit the default response to a final response that now considers this, this new knowledge because that we want to uh, introduce. And this is one of the work that, that we uh, 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 talked about in ACL 2022. Right, so, uh, so we are proposing this concept of post hoc knowledge injection in generated dialogue. Uh, and very simply, we have two steps. One, you have to acquire this knowledge in a post hoc fashion. And then you have to inject. Like so, I'm going to just break it down into two very simple steps. So let's look at the knowledge equation first. Now, when we talk about knowledge equation, it's really what we are doing is knowledge retrieval, right? So we are trying to retrieve the most relevant knowledge given the dialogue history, and you can always always pick and choose from where you want to get the knowledge. You have the liberty to do that, right? You can just use Yelp, for example, or you can use like GPT-3 or large language model if you think that it can give factual you know, the knowledge for that, for example, common sense visiting and stuff like that. So here, for example, if I look at this dialogue history and I found that, oh, there are some important keywords like San Diego. So I want to know about San Diego. Now, uh, you can always construct these prompts, for example, for these large language models and say that, well, uh, can you tell me what is San Diego is famous for? It can say that oh, it's for, for the beaches and the tacos, for example. I mean, this is a very simple prompt. You can, of course, come up with much more complex, more, and you know, convenient uh, you know prompt that can give you, lead to give you better knowledge levels. Or simply, you can just con take this dialogue history as a query, and you can just look through a corpus, like let's say Yelp reviews, uh, basically that is sorted by recency for this kind of problem, and you find out what is the most relevant review I, I get in 2020, for example. And it can perfectly teach you that well. You should go to Lock Shores, uh, whatever, right? So this, this part is very simple and you can really have your best knowledge retrieval system here. It's really plug and play, right? You are doing everything in post hoc, so it doesn't really affect the way the model performs. Right, and in this fashion, you can collect, let's say, thousands of actually relevant knowledge about one particular dialogue history. Now, now that's great. And ideally, all of these retrieval process would eventually fetch you something that is relevant. It will probably tell you the knowledge that is about San Diego, hopefully. Uh, kind of expected behavior. But the problem is that often there are lots of redundant knowledge you, you also get through this retrieval mechanism, right? Uh, now, you have to understand why we are concerned about this because we are trying to inject this knowledge in a post hoc fashion in this dialogue model, right? So you have to make sure that it's not too lengthy inference, inference process, right? You are doing everything in the test time. So 
if you're really injecting like thousand knowledge like one by one that will take so many time it probably doesn't really make sense so i think from a practical standpoint you also want to kind of filter it down your your collected knowledge which are really unsupervised to a set that is most relevant and also most diverse right you want to really get that that set and for that we we use this these two metrics called relevance and redundancy and we kind of wanted to do a sampling process so basically let's say if we have n knowledge snippets retrieved we want to count it like a b subset and that b you can decide based on your budget like for example okay i only want to work with five knowledge snippets like what should be my best those five knowledge snippets they should be most relevant and they should be most most diverse right so using these two these two metrics uh, metrics we kind of use the like unsupervised sampling algorithm uh, uh, that basically samples down from this n set to this small b set Uh, in such a way that that they are most relevant and their redundancy is low as low as possible so and of course it's like in hard problem in a way so we kind of did like a greedy way of uh, sampling this knowledge set so you pick the most relevant one and you kind of expand that set by adding the the most diverse knowledge that is also high in the relevance score and you kind of go it till till the till your budget so now you have, you are you have these five knowledge snippets which are probably most relevant and of course kind of diverse now practically this is great and theoretically looks great the question is that does it does this selection step is really useful or is it like you could just 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 take like top 5 relevant knowledge snippets and just work with it you can do that but there are some emerging properties that coming out from the selection step what we found uh, that was especially useful for knowledge that we got from the parametric sources like language models we found that Uh, to start with the knowledge that we get from these language models are not really factual to start with like some of the examples i showed but when we performed this selection step we saw that the set we finally got the b small set it actually have much less number of non factual documents so it's kind of like a emerging property that we are getting that we are somehow able to filter it down to the knowledge snippets that are probably more factual uh, i mean it's it's really a, an empirical result but it, it we found that it's happening for most of the data sets so uh, i think that could be that could be interesting to look at so in that case in the, the gpt2 recommendation hmm? case are you not using any non parametric like grounded knowledge yeah no i mean i'm just looking at like knowledge got from two different sources and just yeah so like if if gpt2 is just lying right you know it's famous for its igloos it's also famous for its um, you know caves or something like that is but yeah. um the those are going to be distinct from each other they're going to be responsive to the query it, it seems kind of strange that, that this should somehow filter out fake knowledge right yeah i mean that's that's true i mean that's what i said that uh, i still don't know how it is happening it's probably that these fake knowledge are probably less diverse for example they're probably more generic and that's probably one of the way, that's why i'm saying like it's kind of a really interesting empirical results uh, that is coming out uh, so yeah just wanted to point it out uh, right cool so now we we get this five knowledge and now we want, we can now inject it very easily so we are done with the retrieval step uh, and what we really do here for the injection we inject each of the knowledge one by one so and that essentially gives out like b candidates responses now you can pick whatever the one you, you want the best like you can do another kind of free ranking based on your diversity metric or whatever right so let's think that we have one knowledge snippet and we want to inject that with our default response So let's see. So we have this data model. Now this this data model initially took this data history as an input at the test time, and it basically generated this distribution of logits from which you can, if you sample it, it will probably give you this default response, right? And uh, but we don't want this default response. We want it to look more informative in a way that we can inject the knowledge. So we want to inject this knowledge uh, somehow in this data response, right? So a very vague way of uh, framing that question would be that. we want our final response to look more like this knowledge snippets right i mean that's probably one definition of injecting the knowledge in, into the default response and for that i think what we do is that we kind of try to align this final logic distribution coming out from the data model to more look like the knowledge the logic distribution for the knowledge and what is a logic distribution for the knowledge it's simply one hot factor representation of this not of the of this textual knowledge so essentially we want to minimize the scale divergence between the initial logic distribution and this knowledge distribution so that's one constraint and 
if you do that just uh, it's possible that it will completely steer away from your dialogue history and it will just basically parrot the knowledge right so you still want to maintain the fluency so in a way you still want to make sure that the final distribution you get after this editing is still it deals with the dialogue history so you can think of there is a off the shelf enteller or entitlement scorer that gives you a score that tells you that oh this is actually 80% entirely it's still good so you, you can go ahead right so now we have these two constraints and you can think of these are like two different objectives or losses you can calculate and based on that losses you can modify the model output state now here is the interesting part we are not really updating the model parameters but using some gradient propagation we are updating the model output states right so you're basically changing the logic distribution not really changing any of the parameter that is responsible to generate the logic distribution so you're really editing on the final output states of the model uh, and if you just change your final logic, logic distribution, you can if, and if you can really sample it, and it will generate a different response. And since we have constrained it in this way, it'll it'll generate that that looks like more like knowledge, and it's probably a tell with the dialogue history. And you can really play around how much you want the fidelity to be, and how much you want it to be in there, right? So yeah, so we have looked at a way to collect this knowledge at the test time, and then inject the knowledge uh, into the model. And we applied that to this goal-oriented dialogue setup, where usually we don't expect the knowledge to be around with this data set, or, or at least this data set doesn't come with the associated knowledge. So we wanted to understand, and we have a very good idea of what is the conversation of goal means in this setup, that you want to book a restaurant, right? So as efficiently as you can do would be the better, right? So the question we are asking that if we have a knowledge injected dialogue system, can it make us efficiently reach our conversational goal as compared to the baseline models? So let's look at a, a sample conversation. So a user is <coughs> looking for a place to eat that is cheap. Now the system asks that, oh, do you have a location preference? This is a default response and you have nothing to retrieve knowledge for. So we just pay with the default response. Now the user says that, yes, center, center of the town in Cambridge, by the way, this data, this uh, sample responses are coming from the data set, so that's why it's talking about Cambridge, uh, you know, the multi os data set. Now, <clears throat> you can always look for, uh, you know, related uh, uh, knowledge from the Yelp reviews, for example, restaurants in the Cambridge, and it says that, well, there are Asian cuisines, uh, for example, they're inexpensive, and they're famous because they're they of value for money. Now, it injects that to the default response, and it says that we can go for the Asian cuisine, the most important part is that it adds this, this opinion that they're value for money, which you do not have access to the in the model or in the data, but you get it from the data. Is the initial response was used to do the retrieving? Yes, yes, that's right. That's where we basically get this Indian and Chinese kind of uh, keywords. Now, uh, now the user says that, well, do you still have any res restaurants that serve English food? So they basically had a different preference, right? Now you are recommending something, they had a different preference. So you have to somehow convince them to come to a solution. And this is the interesting part. So, so uh, the point is that the initial response says that the English restaurants are around the center are mainly for fine dining, so they're not really inexpensive. And we found a relevant review that's interesting that talks about that people like English food, also generally like Indian food in general. I mean, that's kind of a popular opinion. So it, it really tries to give that opinion that, oh, even if I don't find you the right recommendation that you're looking for, this is still a good substitute that you could go for the Asian cuisine. And then users say, that, like, okay, I'll lock on with the Indian food, right? So what's really happening here that this additional knowledge helps the user to navigate to the recommendation and probably reach, reach to a conclusion more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And indeed that what we looked into this user study we did, that more number of people could achieve their conversational goals as compared to the baseline model. And they said that the, the knowledge that was injected as compared to the baseline model was actually useful for them to reach the conversation. So this was actually really useful in the real time. And objectively, if we look at the number of turns it took for the users to reach the conversation goal was much lower for our system. That means it's just being more efficient and giving us, giving us the right knowledge so that you can reach your recommendation quickly. So that was also uh, interesting that this additional knowledge improves user efficiency in a way, or that is in this setting. Yeah. Just more of a curiosity, how do you get the information from Yelp? Is it through like an API or? Yeah, so I mean, for the purpose of this experiment, we kind of, yeah, kind of downloaded the Yelp reviews and we have like a fast retriever where we just get the data history, get the keyword, and retrieve in, in the database. Oh. Uh, but yeah, you can use an API or you can do so. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Uh, so this is a very cool technique you saw that oh, you can inject knowledge.
knowledge at the test time now you can still do many things for example like a fun project we tried we tried to inject like stories and narratives retrieved from some data set and inject to a dialogue model so the dialogue that talks about stories and experiences uh, but the problem with this grading based decoding is that it's really expensive because you still have to do perform this editing at the test time so it, it takes around like 30 seconds for example to give you a response as compared to just like a one shot inference which takes like probably one or two seconds right uh, <clears throat> another problem with this uh, this method is that it only works with general text so you cannot really inject like more structured knowledge let's say like a common graph or subgraph that you want to inject in the uh, in the response uh, so for that you still have to go for this training time augmentation somehow uh, and you know do that knowledge injection which we looked at in another work uh, earlier work right so <clears throat> in summary uh, we, we looked at this on the fly knowledge acquisition various kind of knowledge like textual knowledge narrative structured common sense uh, we all talked about the post hoc methods but there are also like other training time methods we we show that uh, these knowledge injected models are are better at uh, you know uh, allowing users to achieve their conversation goals successfully and efficiently and some of bridges this knowledge gap which i kind of started with uh, saying that oh it doesn't really have this recent knowledge about what's going on in the world and uh, i mean in, in the landscape of this whole knowledge grounded on knowledge augmented models in fact there are lots of other things uh, for example one should care about like dialogue state tracking for example you know personalized knowledge or user specific knowledge that there are several other works i looked at it and and we we did we did all of this and then kind of implemented a, a alexa version of it right we, uh, we were doing this alexa prize and surprisingly everything was useful but there were almost 50 percent of utterances that say that oh why should i trust this response like so there is this the expectation of anthropomorph anthropomorphism in this AI system that it should really talk like human and talk like tell me factual things. But really the problem is that this attribution of these knowledge sources, for example, why do we attribute this? For example, well, I mean, why should I believe that I should go to Balboa Park? Why did you get that knowledge? It doesn't say that. It says that you just go to Balboa Park. That's it. So this is like a very important uh, recent research direction, attributing these dialogue responses to, to the grounding knowledge. And that kind of leads to me this interesting future research question that what do we mean by this required knowledge? So, and also for all of these future direction slides, we'll just go through the motivational examples. We can come to the text later. Uh, so for example, let's say, let's say a user is looking for some pain medication. Uh, uh, you can always found, find some do uh, like documents from the internet. Now, whenever they add this new information that I'm 70 years old and I have CKD of stage four, uh, your, your, your retrieve set would really change because some of the documents would be completely invalid because some of the medications probably won't be, you know, really applied to that case, right? So how do we really change these based on user definition and domain, for example, is, is a really important and interesting question. Uh, another, another thing is that the ambiguity that is presented in this context, like, for example, if you ask that I'm looking for some pain medication, what do you mean by that? Like how severe is that pain, for example, or how long are you having that pain, right? That really changes what kind of knowledge you want to inject. So in these cases, one of the interesting approaches would be to asking these clarification questions based on this ambiguity of the context. And then based on the answer, you would retrieve the knowledge and do the knowledge injection. So that's also like an interesting, interesting situation, right? So yeah, so we kind of talked about this post hoc knowledge injection to how to make make the models relevant and we saw that there are lots of in other emerging properties and interesting feature questions that we can we can talk about right so yeah i think we are kind of at the end of chapter one and i'll slowly move into chapter two that's about explanations and it's somewhat relevant to what we have just described and it's also about this knowledge grounding in gener gener in in generating explanations in fact because the expression that we get also we kind of consume and it has to be factually or knowledge grounded uh, based on our world knowledge right so i'll talk about that in this in this chapter right so what do we mean by explanations for for, for example so let's say here is the image and there's a question that how does person two feel about the person one telling right so it's really about feeling and this very implicit knowledge right and the answer is that he is concerned and a little upset right now if you want if you don't see this and if you want the model to point out which part of the input do you think is most important it probably only just show the person two and person one right but that's not the full explanation why this answer is correct because that's obvious right but it doesn't really tell about this implicit knowledge about this emotional connect and what's really going on 
and you really probably need language to explain that in a way. Right? You might say that, oh, he's in shock, thinking something bad might happen, and that's why this answer is true. Now, it would be great if the model can come up with this kind of natural language explanation to explain these kind of very complex reasoning tasks. Right? Now, of course, uh, uh, there should be some important properties that these explanations should hold. First, that they have to be plausible and consistent with the input. They should be accurate and faithful. They should really, really uh, portray what the model is doing as part of its reasoning process. And finally, they should be grounded in world knowledge. Like, for example, this idea of being in a shock, thinking something bad might happen, this concept is really coming from our understanding of the world, right? It's not explicitly present anywhere in the, in, in the input. So we, you have to make sure the explanation you generate, it's somehow grounded in the world knowledge, either explicitly collected or based on some external knowledge base. Uh, I'll break it, break it into, more, into more details uh, right now. So let's take a concrete example. This is the task of natural language inference, uh, as some of you might know. So there is a premise. Uh, two men are competing in a bicycle race. And then there is a hypothesis that people are riding bikes. The question is that it is if the hypothesis entails the premise, or does it contradict the premise, or it's like neutral, like doesn't have any connection, right? So that's a task we're solving. And here it entails the premise. Now, for this kind of task, you want to generate a textual abstraction of the model explanation. For example, a perfectly valid explanation of this label would be competing in a bicycle race require men or slash people riding bikes. So that's why uh, that's why this hypothesis entails the premise, right? Now the question is that it really assumes this declarative set of knowledge. So it basically assumes that bicycle race requires bikes, race requires riding bikes, men are people, so and so forth, right? These are the set of declarative knowledge that is somehow getting synthesized in this NLE so that you can actually generate this NLE. But these are not explicitly anywhere mentioned in the input. So our argument is that you should at least have access to this knowledge or somehow provide this declarative set of knowledge to the model so that it makes sure that it generates this NLE, which is probably grounded in the knowledge. And we have seen that the baseline model, again, really hallucinates. It comes up with random explanation, which doesn't have a lot of uh, sense or a or lot of grounding with the world knowledge. The question is where do we get this knowledge, right? From the input, because we only have access to the input at the test time. So we found that there are these predictive parts of the input or these tokens or set of tokens that has very high predictiveness of the, of the final level, right? For example, men, bicycle race, riding bikes. These are the most important token in the input that, that tells me about this prediction, for example. And we found that these tokens are also helpful for us to gather this knowledge from an external source, right? So if you know about men or bicycle race or people riding bikes, you probably can fetch this declarative set of knowledge from some external sources because we don't have access to these in the training data, right? So, uh, and these predictive parts are, uh, are known as rationals in the ex ex explanatory literature. They're called like extractive rationals, right? So basically what we are saying here that this rational induced knowledge it would be something really useful for the model to come up with a knowledge grounded uh, natural language explanation. And if we look at the previous literature, they look at this problem of knowledge grounding and explanation, or this explanation really you know, is depending on the model's reasoning process, and they're not really like post hoc or justification, like GPT-3, like, oh, can you explain this, for example? Uh, they, are, they are not really doing all both of this together. And this is the first time we try to connect this rationals this knowledge and the explanation in a more coherent and a causal fashion. And this is the work that we presented in ICML this year. Right, so let's look at this pipeline kind of step by step uh, and exactly following the motivation. So first we have this input. We want to identify the most important part of the input. And that's what, what we call rational extraction. So we extract these important parts highlighted in the yellow. Now using this, this highlighted parts or the rationals, we query our external uh, knowledge model, let's say, and get this declarative set of facts. For here, for this, this the task we have looked at, we saw that it's mostly the common sense knowledge that, that were most useful. So we queried a common sense knowledge base, for example. So this is the common sense knowledge base. Now we get all sorts of knowledge snippets based on this query. <clears throat> Again, going back to the selection step that we talked about in the dialogue project, that not all of the knowledge are useful, right? 
So you still have to select the best knowledge that is probably most useful for your reasoning process. And this is more critical because here you are really changing the way model would reason this, this explanation, right? So you have to make sure that the knowledge you are providing to the model is absolutely relevant. Once we get this relevant knowledge, maybe the first and the fourth one, we basically now try to synthesize and come up with a natural language abstraction of it. This is really like a paraphrasing you can think of, but it's useful because once the model can reason through these knowledge snippets, it probably can actually do the correct prediction. And that's exactly what happens when it can somehow explain it using these two, these two knowledge snippets, it can perfectly come up with the correct prediction, right? So you see that this rational extraction, knowledge augmented, knowledge you know, uh, acquisition and uh, natural language expression generation is really tied to the process of prediction. And as a purpose of this model, we train the whole pipeline in a supervised fashion. We train everything end to end. So that to make sure that this rational extraction this knowledge acquisition and selection and natural language generation, explanation generation is tied to the, the, the prediction process so that it really remains faithful. And uh, you know, why does it work? And I was really thinking that, uh, why does it work? You might have heard about this chain of thoughts idea where if you provide like a chain of thoughts, a chain of reasoning steps to a model, it can it can come up with a prediction better. So if you give, you, if you give a model better hints about how to arrive to the prediction, it might help. And this is exactly what is happening here. We are somehow giving these hints through this set of knowledge and letting the model arrive to this prediction. So we are basically giving the model about help about world using giving world knowledge so that it allows it to come up with a plausible uh, explanation and eventually uh, the, the prediction. Good. Yeah. Yep. It doesn't, I mean, so based on this description, it yeah. looks like you're not doing anything to. Um, make sure that you've covered all of the important parts. Right. So like if you had the sentence two men are writing about a mm -hmm. bicycle race, mm -hmm. you could do all the steps that you did. Yeah. Because you, you've gotten all the necessary tests, but not all the sufficient tests. Yeah. So do you do something to, to, yeah. to cover that? Yeah, right. So uh, there is, a, uh, since we, we don't have supervision on which part of the input are actually useful, so we do kind of this latent sampling, like which one is the most sufficient and useful. So there is a, some kind of constraint that we have added that you have to select the part that are most sufficient and then also it has to be sparse. So there is a little bit of like RL type or kind of uh, algorithm involved. It's not like really RL, it's kind of the continuous reaction of that. So basically something like a Gumbel softmax sampling happening here. And uh, in, a, in a way, make sure that, oh, you only select the part that is most really, most sufficient and again, it's sparse. So, yeah. So we looked through this uh, various range of tasks from natural language and visual language domain. Uh, it's kind of useful uh, and you can apply this framework. And we found that, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the quality of these explanations, we are doing way better than, than the <coughs> state-of-the-art model, where most of the state-of-the-art models were like T5 or BART kind of model, where they were like really big large language models, but they never had access to the knowledge. So really showing that this additional knowledge is, is really helping and pushing the performance to be to be better. Uh, and we also did some kind of human evaluation on these generative explanations because that's kind of the gold standard ex experiment that we do for these generative projects. And I think it's a similar trend. We find that uh, people found the explanation that we generated are more plausible uh, as compared to the one, uh, one that generated by the baseline. I think mainly because they were more knowledge grounded, so it, it looked sound, sound to them as compared to the baseline explanations, which were really like generic. For example. Now, this pattern looks great and the result looks great. Now, the question is that, well, all of the five tasks I showed, we had access to the gold NLEs, right? So, once you had access to the gold NLEs at the training time, you can really compute a loss that, oh, the NLE you are generating, is it really matching with the gold explanation? If not, then you really change your way, the way you're getting the knowledge and everything, right? But there are lots of data sets where you have these data points and the labels but you don't have access to this gold natural language explanation for the prediction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the question is that can we use this pipeline in a more zero short fashion? Because there are two points from where we are getting the supervision. One is the NLE and one is the final final prediction, right? Because, because you have access to those levels. The question we are asking that just based on these levels and based on this pipeline, can we still get the most relevant knowledge that is required for this prediction? And this is very similar setup as knowledge grounded uh, models, any models, for example, like you have to do knowledge grounding for common sense reasoning, for example, even if you don't care about the uh, explanation. Interestingly, we found that, uh, I mean, it's not better than our supervised model, 
but this zero shot model actually performs better than many of the supervised baseline models. So, so really this, this knowledge grounding was the key to really pushing this explanation to be very high quality, for example, which were not present in the P5 based or board based model. So this is really a strong result. And also again, kind of reflective of the fact that how this large language model sub works because they are kind of acts as a knowledge base, for example. Right. And the last thing we wanted to look at that, okay, we looked a lot about explanation quality. What about the task performance? Is it going down? Is it going bad? Interestingly, uh, so the, so the uh, solid yellow is the state of the art um, model and most of the time they are black box for those tasks. Now this pale yellow are the state of the art that are explainable or provide some kind of explanation. And what we are really seeing that there is a cost of explainability. So explainability is coming at a cost of the predictive performance. When you are making your model explainable, it, it, your task performance is dropping. I mean, that's what we are, we are seeing in state of the art. Actually, and thankfully, we are merging that gap. We are seeing that we are, we are not really compromising with the task performance. And why? Because we have this extra knowledge grounded step that is not only helpful for the explanation generation, but also helpful for the original task. So you're really not compromising around that and somehow bridging this gap of task predictive performance and the explainability. And this is something that we expect. So, yeah. Is there a constraint that the explanation would be a good explanation in some way? Uh, for the previous or one? Either, either yours or the previous one. Like, you know, like, you can generate an explanation. It could just be a sequence of zeros and ones, right? Yeah. So I think for the previous models, especially which are generating these natural language explanations, they're really like very templatic and they're really like very generic because they're some fine tuned models, right? And these templatic explanations are not really helpful, helpful for the model to do, to perform the actual task because. It still hurts the performance. Yeah. Yeah, and why it is happening is because that maybe this black box models has learned, learned some kind of spurious correlation. And when you're making it explainable, you're really hurting that. You are saying that, oh, you cannot really make that spurious correlation because you have also have to come up with this plausible explanation, right? And that's probably which we're hurting, at least for the baseline models, for example. Uh, for us, it's still almost like we are actually almost like at par, yeah. Right, but, but maybe your explanations are worse. I'm not saying like, what are you using to constrain the, the, the quality of the explanations? Oh, I mean, we are not, but empirically we show, we see that it's our, our explanations are, are also better. Yeah. I mean, like I could probably yeah. give you a, you know, something that matches exactly the orange because my explanation will always be, it will be a bad faith explanation. God said so. Will be yeah. The right. Right. The argument here we are making that hopefully this additional knowledge grounding is somehow helping both of the tasks. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that even if it, even if let's say the, the original task performance and the explanation doesn't have any connection. And, I mean, for example, you can say that you can have a perfectly bad explanation, but with a very good task performance. It's just that our pipeline is this knowledge grounding step, which we arguably, you know, at least for the task we have tried, has the connection of the improvement of the performance in both of these cases. And maybe that is helping. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So in summary, I think we see that this model is capable of generating these nice extractions. It also works with images pretty nicely. Uh, it can generate the selected knowledge. And the funny part is that you can actually decode that what are the knowledge it has selected. So it's kind of an explanation of explanation, right? You are basically attributing your explanation saying that, oh, here are the set of declarative knowledge from which I got this explanation. And you can actually really check that. So that was, was pretty useful in general. Uh, and uh, we see that it really reduces the ambiguity in the explanation, right? There, there's a concept of over trusting these explainable models because explanations are also kind of black box. You don't know how they are coming from. But this is one way of attributing your explanation, saying that oh, here's the set of knowledge from based on which I came up arrived this explanation. And uh, we found that apart from all of the results I showed, these knowledge grounded models in general have lots of other emerging properties, like. For example, we found in another work that when you do this knowledge grounding, it actually improves factuality in the explanation. And we tried it with a more recommendation setup because if you somehow if actually ground these explanations, of course, it will improve your factuality, which is not really true with the, you know, again, the very large language models, for example. It also improves the robustness because if you make sure that your explanation is knowledge grounded, and if you make some kind of like a knowledge kind of adversarial attack, changing the entities or making it negations or whatever, it's much more robust as compared to that is not really grounded because it doesn't really know what to do. And finally, it is more faithful we have seen just because that 
you have constrained the whole process through this knowledge grounding, it generates more faithful explanation as compared to, uh, again, the state of the art models. So that's great. And uh, and the, yeah, so in the landscape of this explainable AI, I think we looked at these, these angles of task performance, plausibility, robustness, and everything. And these large language models are, again, excellent zero-shot reasoners at times, but still they are often confused and they're kind of self-conflicting in, in a way. Uh, there are evidences that are coming in kind of leads to us some of the interesting research questions that I want to look at in future. So again, just let's look at the motiva motivating example. We have found that even if the model had access to the correct background knowledge, it still cannot reason it properly in the explanation. Like for example, here, the question is, you use detergent to dye your hair. You have this background knowledge that detergent is only used on clothes, detergent is harm, harmful for skin, that's are probably good enough to come up with the explanation that why this statement is invalid. That's a prediction. But the model said no, which is a correct prediction, because detergent cannot dye your hair. So it's really just negating the hypothesis and giving you an explanation. That's, it's not really informative, right? So despite of having this knowledge ground, you can still come up with the explanation, which is not sound in reasoning. So it's not only the knowledge, but how you reason through this knowledge, how you combine this knowledge in a more logical fashion is, is another key to improve these explanations. And that's kind of one of the limitations that we have found even in our models. So could be an interesting future direction to look at. And another thing is it's more subjective and very close to my heart. For example, the same example, if a kid is asking that question, and if an adult is asking that question, your explanation ideally should be different. Like you might just say that, oh, detergent is only used on clothes for the kid because that's probably the, the most relevant information. But for an adult, you could say that, no, it's not really a dyeing agent, but it might make your hair brittle, which probably may be not you know, useful for a kid like two years old, for example. So how do you really change these explanations according to who are using that system, for example? So, so, the, so this duality of this general purpose explainer versus user specific explainer is something another interesting such question that we can we can look at all right so yeah we're end of chapter two we looked at this knowledge grounding uh, in this generative explanations and we found that there are several interesting properties and future directions that uh, that can be interesting right and all right so now i'm cruising through this final chapter uh, uh, so it has some connection with chapter two we are going to use a concept that we introduced is rationals or the most important part of the input being predictive for a for a prediction. But we are, we are looking at a different problem for, for this and we'll see that how human in the loop kind of setup would be useful for uh, uh, for achieving this task. So a little bit of gear shift. Uh, we talk about the subjectivity in AI and not in AI, for example. I mean, data, data sets are biased, uh, have biases. It is included in the model, but again, the model doesn't really know how to use that bias, you know, positive, right? It just uses randomly, right? And there are, there are growing evidence that shows that maybe human in the loop is the way to kind of tweak the model, steer the model accordingly, because it has the knowledge, but it doesn't know how to use that knowledge, right? So kind of using that very high level thought. Uh, and the task we are looking at here is debiasing, I guess. Some of you are familiar with debiasing. The task is simple. So you, you are given a biography, like a short biography. You want to predict the profession uh, from that biography, like what profession of this person has, right? Now, in the data, historically, we have seen that there is a very strong correlation with the gender of the person and the profession that the, that the label is, right? Now, uh, now, how do we know? For example, let's say you have trained your model with this data, with this classifier. And you ask this question, is my model biased? Probably yes, because your data is biased, right? The question is, how do I know how much bias I have in the model, right? So one of the popular idea is that oh, you look at the representation and try to predict the gender level from the representation, which is a sensitive attribute. So if your representation does give out the gender information, right? That means it contains that information. That means it has used that information somehow to do the prediction of the task of predicting professions, right? So, um, and if you if you do that, if you have a biased model, and if you have this chart where we have the i-axis in the task performance, the uh, y-axis, and the x-axis about bias in the model, it will land up in this right-hand side, where it is high in the task performance, it can perform the task correctly, but it also has a lot of bias in the model, right? 
So people took up, took up this opportunity of looking through the representation and they said that, oh, we can actually cleverly change the representation in a way that it, it can no, you can no longer predict the agenda, but you can still predict the task, right? It's a very popular way of adversarial training and debiasing, right? It's a very popular method. What really happens then that in this plot, it does decrease the bias, but it actually drops also the task performance. Now, the question is, like, that's not desirable, right? We want to go into the left half of this graph, right? Now, now the question is why? And people are clueless why that is happening because it's just representation that's numbers, right? So my argument here is, let's not look at the representation. Let's look at the explanation of the model and see what's happening, right? Because then you know, are they biased or not? Or after debiasing, something better, better happen. And we will use this rational, right? These important parts of the input that are predictive of the task. And we're going to analyze these rationals. So in the bias model, you see the rationals. It's using all these gender pronouns and everything to do the prediction, right? We debiased it with the representation technique. And it actually removed all the necessary information it required to do the prediction, right? Mm -hmm. This is probably debiased, but this is not useful because now you're predicting like fashion designer from this, from this rational, right? So the question is, this is also not ideal, right? And uh, the question is, uh, how, do we, how do we fix this? And this is one of the work that we present in the MLP, also like ongoing work. My, my approach is very simple. So let's say we have this debiased model. Let's proactively add minimally biased tokens that is good enough to flip your prediction to be correct, but your rational still remains like minimally biased. This is really like a trade-off, right? You cannot really achieve this perfect debiasing and perfect task performance. And in fact, in the fairness literature, they call this fair debiasing. So the fair debiasing is that, well, you still have to retain your task performance because if it is bad, then it's not really useful, right? Now, now, now what is happening behind the scene and what do we want to do in general, right? So, so there is these tokens and each of the tokens has certain contribution for the task predicting profession. Now, all of these tokens also have certain contribution for predicting gender. A very simple heuristic would be to penalize the, the, the word that has high bias, but also high contribution for the task, right? So someone want to adjust this in a way that it doesn't look up to the word that is high, con high contribution for the task as well as high contribution for the bias because they are the most problematic word, right? And the model will eventually land up to them if you don't do any kind of bias. But you still want to retain most of the informative word because if you don't, then you will end up with the wrong prediction, right? So you can do this, this penalization thing in a way that oh, if bias contribution is high for a, for a token, you apply a penalty. If the bias contribution is low, you don't apply a penalty. And what will happen that it will basically look into this middle part of the distribution where you have moderately predictive token, but very low bias, right? And those, are, those could be useful actually to, to do this balance, for example. Now, you can do this in many ways. You can, you can basically get this bias importance from an off-the-shelf model and re-rank your tokens, right? And uh, do some kind of ranking and you said, oh, you only use top half or you can come up with complex penalty functions. What I'm interested in is that can we do it using in user interventions? Like, can we do this balancing with user interventions? And I'll, I'll come to why that, that is needed or that is required, for example. So we did all of this. We did use some kind of penalty based on some heuristics and we have this model. Uh, so now for the same input, we get this bias rationals from a fixed pre gender classifier. It shows me that oh, these are the words that are not supposed to be there in the rationals. Now we did a debiasing based on the penalty technique I talked about. And it basically gave me these task rationals. It gave me a correct prediction. It did remove most of the word, but it says that, oh, for me to really retain the prediction to make sure the prediction is correct, I, I cannot do without Angela Linville and model. I mean, I have to keep that in my task rations, right? Now, now that's a problem, right? I mean, it's very difficult to do this balance just statistically learning from the data. And most importantly, your pre-trained gender classifier also could be not perfect. Like, for example, it's just 80% or whatever its precision, right? And most importantly, this, this understanding of bias is also very subjective. Maybe for me, having this Angela Linville doesn't really matter because I don't see it as a gendered name. But maybe for you, you do see it as a gendered name and you don't want model to consider the name to be predictive of its prediction, for example, right? So it's really subjective. 
and also let's look at this graph once more. We we are able to retain the task performance, for example, and decrease the bias. It's still not better than the baseline with the bias model, but it's too, we're doing much better, for example, as compared to the others. But the problem is there is still a problem. It's still not perfect. And my idea is that can you can you do a little bit better with users in the loop, with human in the loop? And I explain why, because the bias classifier is not perfect, neither is the data. Uh, and hopefully this debiasing is really subjective, right? And hopefully users are better teaching at the models rather than just learning everything from the data. So let's look at some examples very quickly, how we want to achieve that. So this is the this is the same example. Uh, this is where we add. We have a trained model. It gets some some results which are moderately okay, but we want to improve from here. Now let's say user can give instructions saying that hey, don't use the word model, and don't use any name, right? So that's you are kind of defining the bias on your own way. And let's say model has a way to understand this feedback and directly apply it to its on its task rationals, right? So it basically changes its task rationals. Now it's the same same situation. It basically doesn't use the word model, doesn't use the, uh, any name, and ends up being predicting down. Now user understands that oh, this is a case really on the on the borderline. I cannot really get the perfect debiasing. I still have to add something, and user can redefine their bias definition, saying that well, maybe you should consider using the word model, but still don't use any name. And that's a good balance, right? You can use the word model. That's good enough to for you to make the prediction correct. It still, it still doesn't use any name. This is probably like a reasonable, reasonable uh, trade-off that you can make for this particular data point. And what I'm getting at is that this capability, if we can have with a trained model, we can further fine-tune the performance of these models with this human in the loop setup. I'm not going to the much details, but just giving a very high-level overview of the pipeline. Uh, very simple. You have to parse the user feedback. We do it using like a sequence labeling task. So basically a natural language feedback gets converted to token level feedback, right? And what we are really giving feedback is on the bias, right? So you're really, really suppressing this 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 bias rational. You're saying that, oh, I'm giving you the new bias definition and you change your task rational accordingly, right? So you basically have this <laughs> Angela Lindman is a model, blah, 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 whatever is the feedback. Uh, feedback is that Angela Lindman is a woman's name and you don't want to use it. And it gets converted to token level feedback. Oh, is this token high in bias based on user? Is, the, is, is this token low in bias based on the user? Or no action from the user? So retain whatever you had previously, right? Very simple kind of setup. You can, of course, improve it. <clears throat> and once you get this, this feedback somewhat consumable for the model, you update your bias rational. And once you update your bias rational, you then update your task rational based on that. And once your task rational is, is changed, your prediction will also change. So there is like this sequence of procedure that happens once the feedback is landed. Uh, <clears throat> like I'm saying, I'm not going into the details, but think about it, right? I mean, uh, remember we had this post hoc editing in our dialogue uh, project where we had this distribution, logic distribution. Here you also have a distribution of this bias, right? Uh, and you are basically getting a new bias distribution from the user. So what you could do really minimize the scale divergence, same thing, kind of and kind of aligning into the user the way what user is saying, and change your model state in such a way that it produces a new set of task rational and new prediction. Right. So that's one of the technique we have used. And I think the important part here is that we are not making any parameter update. We are just editing on the model states. So the underlying model remains same, but we are just changing the prediction. All right. So here we were. Uh, we had this DBAS model after training, but no feedback yet. One setup is that we say that, well, you cannot change the prediction. You have to maintain the predict current prediction. So you cannot, you cannot give any feedback that changes the current prediction. But still, if you feel that your task version has some bias, try to decrease it. That was the instruction given for this setup. So ideally, what we what we want that this, this, this line, vertical line to move in the left half. And we found that happening. We found that with, uh, with various kind of uh, technique I talked about, uh, it's possible to further improve the debiasing performance of the model just by doing this user interaction with no change in the model parameters. So what we're really doing is that we're squeezing out the maximum out of the model by this very high quality feedback coming from the user data, right? So that's, that's really cool. And that's really shows the usefulness of this human in the loop setup. Now we become a little bit ambitious and we say that Another setup would be you decrease bias 
but also improve the performance. And why that could happen? Our hypothesis was that there is some spurious correlation that model had learned that 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 are not helping for the model to arrive to the correct prediction. So if you actually somehow disentangle this effect of gender and task, because they're not really the same task, right? You just have to be able to do the profession classification on its own. You really don't have to consider this confounding variable gender, but it is there in the data, right? So if we, if we can disentangle entangle this, we could even improve the task. Problem. So we say that in this study, try to decrease the bias in the task rationals, but also if applicable, if you find that the label is wrong, see if you can change it with some kind of feedback, right? And we found that is happening. And this is this is really surprising to me because we are actually able to get a performance that is better than a biased full text model. So what is really happening, you are really disentangling this confounding variable that were actually harming the model performance. It's just because your data is imperfect, right? And what you're really doing, you are giving this high quality feedback to improve your data or improve the signals from that, from where model can basically improve its performance. So that's also a very, very uh, encouraging results for this setup. All right, so in summary, who is going to save us from this bad AI? users probably, uh, it definitely gives us a lot of controllability, but uh, one of the limitation of this is that we don't remember any of this feedback, right? So if you have to give feedback for each of the data point and we're not able to use this feedback in a more intelligent fashion to apply for the next stream of the test set. So this is a problem of generalizing with user feedback. It's kind of a tricky problem. We looked at it with other setups in some of my previous works, but this is still an open problem, how to learn from user feedback very limited user feedback and then apply it on the next examples. And there are lots of <clears throat> models that are looking at this, this spectrum of interactive AI. There's this memory-based architectures, this additional fine-tuning that you fine-tune with new user feedback. And then there's this post hoc methods, what I described here. And uh, yeah, like some uh, motivating examples, like here, we don't remember this feedback. So you say that don't use any name, it corrected it, Another example, it still uses the name. You have to still say the same feedback. We could have used the previous feedback, right? We could have just said that, well, this user doesn't really like to, to, to be into any names to be used. We don't, we can't do that. So how do we sustain, persist that feedback is an interesting set question. And another is that uh, we looked at these language models, for example, but how about your underlying model is x boost or linear, linear regression? Can you still really interact with the explanation that they produce because they're really offline, right? So basically thinking about this very generic framework of predictable explanation and improving model performance using that framework would be also a very interesting research direction. All right, so we talked about this and we talked about how we can use interactions and explanations to achieve some of these equitable goals we had. Really at the end of this talk, we, we kind of connected most of the goals we promised at the, at the start. Uh, the take home lessons is that yes, uh, you have to make your model, uh, model relevant with up to date knowledge. Knowledge grounding is helpful. User interaction is helpful. Some things are also still in the works, like how can how we can learn over the time with this user feedback, for example. Uh, it does give rise to, to this very exciting set of this, uh, future research questions that that would be probably would be interesting for the community to take up. Uh, yeah, and I just want to thank all of my. Uh, uh, sponsors, my advisor, uh, and my collaborators across the world. We are definitely at a very exciting time of machine learning, but like I said, it does come with its bias. Like I just uploaded my, my profile picture in this flip clip interrogator. It says that I look like a snake and I was with sarcastic smile. So, <laughs> so hopefully with this new generation AI, with this knowledge, explanation, and interaction, we will be able to address this more responsibly. Yeah, uh, thank you again for coming to my talk. Uh, thank you, Budi, for the really great talk. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but I think we can try to squeeze in one or two questions from the right. audience. So I I had a question. Um, can you go back to the slide where you had the the two side-by-side -side, like rankings of words in the sentence. Um, yeah. I was a, a bit confused on like what um, 
what information we're trying to extract here because with the exception of the pronoun she mm -hmm. it sort of seems like all of the content words are very high information and all of the um, non-content words are very low information right yeah i think what we really want to show here is that for example uh the word model, right? Look at the word model. It is very high in the task contribution, okay. but it is it is somewhere low. It is still not the highest rank, right? So that's probably a, a word that we can still use, for example. Okay. But if you look at Angela Linwell, it's still very high. It's in the top three for both of them. Okay. And that's what we want to uh, kind of discard, discard, right? So that is, that is the balance I'm trying to look at. So basically pick up the ones that is low in this uh, bias kind of range, but still moderately high in the task prediction okay. range so that we get this balance of task performance and debiasing. It's really a heuristic. That's that's exactly why we need users to fix it. You saw that even with all of these techniques, it still didn't solve the problem in the, at, at the end doing the training. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it would take, how skilled of a user would it take to give yeah. Good. Yeah. Feedback. Yeah. That's a very interesting question, and I'm kind of debating it myself. That should we uh, allow user to do what they do on their general life? Like, for example, we don't interact with AI systems every day, right? Or, or this kind of system. So we have our own notions and biases, right? So do we make this inter, inter interfaces very simple for them to use, or do we make them allow something that they do, they don't do regularly? For example, we give them proper instructions. And say you say you you enable them to do something else. Like for example, I'll take uh, uh, I'll take the example for our case. We basically resorted to this format of don't use then w colon and then you say the token, right? So people were saying all over the place. If if it is free form, they say that oh I don't like any name to be in there, right? Now that is very difficult to parse as a feedback, for example, and that's not really a useful feedback, right? So. So this is really like uh, like a question that, or do we want the user to be constrained in a way that's most helpful for the model? Maybe for some models, yes. Like, is let's say if we have like a very primitive kind of machine learning model, like linear regression or whatever, which is not very sophist sophisticated to encode this feedback. Maybe yes. Maybe for GPT three, you can just type it out in a thing and it just learn. So that's a that's an interesting question to look at. For this case, we had to kind of constrain it in a way so that it's finally useful. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, so I really I would like to thank Woody for joining us today, and to thank you all, um, um, yeah, for this great seminar. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the next seminar, uh, in next like next week in our um, online seminar. And feel free to reach out to Woody offline if you have any more questions. And thank you. Can you stop the recording, please?